This is CBC Here and Now. There's a new OCI proposal for a wharf and cold storage facility right here in Long Pond in CBS. Coming up on Here and Now, you'll hear about flooding concerns from this local resident. You're living here all your years and see this come here with the potential risk it is, it's very troubling. It's not clear if Marble Mountain is going to open this season, and that has a lot of businesses worried. Skiers represent a significant part of my revenue stream. It's going to be tight, it's going to be tough. What will it mean for the local economy? We'll fill in the blanks. More safety measures at the airport, coming up on Here and Now. Bill Quilty walked into his base. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. Apologies, we're having a, a few little technical uh, problems right now. We start tonight in Placentia, almost 10 years to the day since the town was slammed by Hurricane Igor. And once again, weather has damaged roads and infrastructure. Bill Quilty walked into his basement Saturday morning for a paintbrush and was greeted by ankle deep water. It's just devastating to have water come up like that, you know. A well-known musician, Quilty's precious guitars were soaked. His recording studio likely ruined. Everything that was there, sitting in cases on the floor, it's just ruined. Because the water's up over, you can pick up the guitars and, and the cases and the water was just running down. I've lost thousands and half of thousands of dollars in this. And uh, I'm just uh, hoping that right now that it, uh, it's going to be covered. Now he's crossing his fingers, hoping his insurance will come through. Of course, I'm angry. I mean, uh, I, I know that I'm, I'm going to take a loss in the end of this. Some 200 millimeters of rain drenched the town on Saturday. With Bonds Path at Provincial Road, one of the areas hit hardest. And it appears clogged and crumbling drainage infrastructure may have played a role. One time, they used to be always cleared out. You have a crew going around clearing out the culverts, make sure they're all you know, accessible to the water. And that's not being done to my uh, judgment anyway. I haven't seen it. The water was too much for these old and partially collapsed culverts. The water was uh, pretty well doing a lot of damage. Eroding parts of the street, sending water into basements, and leaving people like Charlie Power scrambling to help his neighbors. This is the second, if not third time this after happening. This driveway turned into a frantic brook, sending water into this house. The mayor has seen this before, a decade ago during Igor. Not as drastic in some areas as Igor, but again, Anybody that wakes up in the morning and they have a, their basement is full of water or they can't get out of a driveway and a lot of flooding certainly, uh, certainly brings back bad memories. So why did this happen again? There were substantial upgrades to the infrastructure. Most of that infrastructure proven to be able to be beneficial to this storm. However, rainfall comes out in different places. It finds its own level. So a lot of the rainfall took different paths and different systems were actually impacted by the rainfall. He's hoping the province will do more of this work on roads it maintains and help the town upgrade its own drainage systems. Previous from the Igor, the provincial government was certainly very supportive. So the town will be lobbying again the provincial government for support to do as well, try to make this up infrastructure upgrade. As for Bill Quilty, he's angry that despite past flooding in the town, the infrastructure wasn't able to handle this latest downpour. And with more weather on the way this week, he's on edge. It's just that the drainage couldn't handle it. And now we have another one on the way on Tuesday or Wednesday. So is the same thing going to happen? Terry Roberts, CBC News, Placentia. Now, it wasn't just Placentia. Heavy rain washed out roads in other parts of the province as well. These are pictures from Route 92 near North Harbor in St. Mary's Bay. The two areas on that stretch were washed out. Transportation crews installed a new culvert and patched the road back up in one place. They're still working on the other washout, but suspect they'll be able to finish up tomorrow. Well, it was the same situation in Salvage, where there was another washout, this time on Route 310. Crews had a temporary fix in place on Saturday. The province is asking people to drive over it with caution. 
Well, those uh, damage is thanks to all of that rain, as Terry mentioned. We did see 5.9 millimeters of rain in Placentia. If you take a look, a number of areas seeing that 100 millimeter uh, mark, including Greens Harbor. And then in St. John's, 55.2 millimeters of rain fell for your Saturday. Uh, after that, the weekend was pretty beautiful. We saw lots of sunshine yesterday. Temperatures this morning quite cool as well. Woke up to 2 degrees in St. John's. John's minus five in Badger and then those temperatures in the single digits across uh, Labrador as well. But beautiful afternoon. We're on the doorsteps of fall tomorrow, feeling very fall like across the board. And uh, that's thanks to a ridge of high pressure. So that's going to slide east as we head through the night tonight. And those cool, calm conditions are leading to another frost advisory for most of the island as our temperatures dip into those single digits. About five degrees for St. John's night three in Cornerbrook. Temperatures in Labrador, 12 degrees for Nain, you should be sitting around eight as your daytime high. So certainly going to be a mild night, but this ridge of high pressure in play. And then we're going to start talking about Teddy. So I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. A 38 year old man was shot during an altercation in St. John's Friday evening. It happened in the Keegan Court area just off Elizabeth Avenue around 5 p.m. Police say it wasn't random. Two men were in an altercation before the shooting. One shot was fired and no arrests have been made. The injury was non-life-threatening. It's the third time in recent weeks police have been in that area. Last month, a man barricaded himself inside a home in Copperthwaite Court. A week earlier, shots were fired before a man and a woman led police on a chase that ended in dildo. Anyone with information on Friday's incident is asked to contact police. Police are also investigating a stabbing that happened in downtown St. John's early Sunday morning. It happened around 4 in the morning near Adelaide Street. A 23-year-old man was taken to hospital with injuries. Police say a verbal altercation took place. A group of men then assaulted the victim and fled. Police don't believe the young man knew the group who attacked him. No arrests have been made. Anyone with information or happen to have security or dash cam footage from the area are asked to contact the RNC or Crime Stoppers. Well, there will soon be a new mandatory screening measure at St. John's International Airport. Temperature checks are already required at major Canadian airports like Toronto and Montreal. Now, 11 smaller airports are getting the same treatment. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. In July, it became mandatory to wear masks here at the St. John's International Airport. As of Wednesday, it will also be necessary to have your temperature taken before you take a flight. It's been put in place as an additional measure to, um, uh, an additional health measure to hopefully give passengers uh, some additional sense of safety and security as they travel through the airport. And it's another measure of testing for the potential of COVID-19. According to the new measure imposed by Transport Canada, any passenger who tests higher than 38 degrees Celsius twice will not be allowed to fly. Exceptions will be made for people with medical certificates saying their elevated temperature is not related to COVID-19. But if they don't have that, they won't be allowed in any Canadian airport for 14 days. They'd be directed back to their carrier to retrieve their bags if they have any, and I guess would be revoked beyond the 14-day period. An elevated temperature doesn't mean a person has COVID-19, but Avery believes temperature checks are another way to reduce the risk of the virus while traveling. CBC News asked Newfoundland and Labrador health officials for comment on this today, but we haven't received a response yet. Here's what the Chief Medical Officer of Health said in August when she was asked about the effectiveness of using temperature checks for screening in schools. Um, we're certainly not entertaining that from a public health point of view. It hasn't been shown to be effective as a screening tool. Um, and certainly symptom screening uh, is more effective. And, uh, and that's what we'll be going with for any visitors to the school. The airport authority hopes the new measure will help put travelers at ease and increase traffic. August is usually the airport's busiest month. But this year, only about 30,000 passengers passed through in August. Less than a fifth of the number of passengers who passed through the airport last August. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, many airlines have been cutting routes during the pandemic, but today PAL Airlines launched a new route, a direct flight between St. John's and Moncton. 
The flight received a water cannon salute as it arrived from Moncton. The flight will operate five days a week and is nonstop. Once the travel restrictions are lifted for Atlantic Canada, PAL says it plans to have the flight continue to Ottawa. We're uh, very focused on uh, growing our company and uh, we've got a lot of uh, operations uh, that we're looking at in the New Brunswick area and uh, this allows us to provide a, a, a great connection between the uh, province of Newfoundland uh, and Labrador with uh, the province of New Brunswick. Well, still no official green light for Marble Mountain this year. We heard from a skier on Friday who wants the hill to open, but as Colleen Connors explains, Marble has a snowball effect on the West Coast economy, and business owners are already anxious to hear what's happening. The hill is quiet now, but will it stay that way this winter? The province says it intends to reopen Marble, but a lot has to be considered with COVID and health guidelines. Well, I'm minutes from the first the chairlift, so obviously skiers represent a significant part of my revenue stream. Dix runs Marble Inn across the street. He offers accommodations, dining, and a spa. If Marble Mountain doesn't open, he says his business will suffer significantly. And given that the, the province of Nova Scotia and PEI probably have quadrupled promote, uh, money spent on small business, it's time for government just to say definitively, yes, we're behind the businesses of Western Newfoundland. Yes, we will see that Marble opens. In downtown Cornerbrook, Newfound Sushi can only offer takeout because of COVID health restrictions. There's no dine-in services. Vincent works nights making sushi to sell at the local Coleman's. He's already changed so much to accommodate COVID life, he's banking on a busy winter. Well, anybody that uh, likes to come to Marble, most of them like to go to Newfound Sushi for après ski and après boarding or whatever. So uh, we rely heavily on, uh, on tourists or people from outside of Cornerbrook and in Cornerbrook to come and, uh, and enjoy themselves, right? He's reopening the dining rooms mid-October and is crossing his fingers that Marble opens. It's going to be tight. It's going to be tough. I mean, we're in the middle of a COVID pandemic. It's... Uh, you really, it's hard to tell, right? Like, definitely numbers will be down, sales will be down. You know, you may have to, we don't know what's going on with Marble, and then you also got possible second wave. Who knows? More than two years ago, the province issued a request for proposals to possibly sell the hill. Government is subsidizing it right now, nearly one million a year. There's been little said about the RFP process, and... Dix believes enough is enough. Well, I think they should either fix some of their management problems, get on with running the hill prof profitably, successfully, even if it requires a subsidy, or sell it. But something should happen. They should get behind Marble. Marble's important to us, and it means something to us. Government hasn't said when anything will be announced. Local business owners are going to have to wait and see what happens. The government still hasn't said a definite yes on opening marble this winter season. Although early bird passes went on sale last year, starting October 1st. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Steady Brook. Well, earlier this summer, two competing tour boat operators came together for the tourism season. They thought joining forces would help them power through the pandemic, but that wasn't the case. Sales at O'Brien's and Gatherall's dropped 92% this year. And as here and now's Heather Gillis reports, they're not alone. O'Brien's and their competitor Gatherall's made headlines earlier this summer when the industry veterans, with 40 years of experience, merged to save their season. And it was a very united front, but there was just not enough energy in it for to make a, a successful venture. Uh, we had less than 8% of what we normally carry, so it was a very difficult year financially. O'Brien would like to see a stimulus package from the federal and provincial governments to help tourism operators. He also says banks should be forced to negotiate with small businesses on good terms so they can get the cash they need. Our banks are finding it difficult, but they're putting a lot of pressure on small business. We don't have a lot of cash floating around, so we depend on our equity that we built up in our businesses, which the banks are not even looking at today. We'll end the season at about you know, 14, 15 percent of last year's revenue. You know, touching... Deborah Borden, co-owner of the Anchor Inn Hotel and a number of other tourism businesses in Twillingate, says 
They did better than expected this year. At first, she thought sales would be 2 to 3 percent of normal. She says the pandemic is crippling the tourism industry. Uh, you know, given that we lost all of April, all of May, most of June, July started out really soft and we're closing down as we speak right now. So we're losing all of October as well. To survive the year, she says their business took on more debt and hired back less than half their regular staff, only 20 of 46. She agrees with O'Brien, saying there needs to be a stimulus package for operators. Her goal is for their businesses to still be standing for the 2021 summer season. We want to be staffed up. We want to be employing people. We want to be helping the economy of our small com rural communities grow. The Department of Health has been tracking people coming in and out of Newfoundland and Labrador this year through roads, airports and marine ports. They say 92,000 people entered the province in June, July and August tourism high season. Normally in a full calendar year, 500,000 people visit the province. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there are new concerns tonight about a proposed OCI wharf and cold storage facility in Conception Bay South. Last week, we told you about a plan to fill in at least four acres of the harbour in Long Pond. Some of the residents worry the development could have damaging consequences come spring. Rennie Perrin lives next to the harbour. He took Here and Now's Adam Walsh out for a boat tour to talk about flood risks. When you first heard about the proposal, what did you think? Uh, disbelief, pretty well, disbelief. I understand it could be a commercial development harbour at any time, but not to the extent that uh, we're starting to learn about. Yeah, the biggest concern that we got, uh, like the, the tidal flows within the harbour, like we live in the inner harbour, the heavy ice is carried by strong tidal currents, and the only exit point for all this ice and the tidal events in this harbour is out through the entrance of the harbour, as you can see, Long Pond Harbour. If this development, for example, were to create a big blockage inside of this harbour to the point and this tidal flow is interrupted and the ice can't exit in a normal flow with the tide, any blockage is going to cause, in our opinion, that we're very concerned it's going to cause a severe backup because Conway's broke the rivers continuously flowing into the harbour. It's like you put a dam across your channel and all the water's got to back up. There's a big concern for us. Any blockage of ice in a narrow passage can out this harbour will cause all severe flooding inside the harbour. You can see here, this uh, the local resident here, you can see by his stock, you can almost see that right now with the high tides, you know, it's about a foot and a half, about a foot and a half probably below his dock on a high tide, right? And when the ice comes down, it scrapes out, it scrapes out along with yourself, right? But if the water is blocked up outside, with ice outside and this passage is blocked, what's going to happen here? This man's dock is going to be raised up, he's all going to be flooded and he's going to lose his property. Yeah. Gotta happen. OCI has spoken with you, Blaine Sullivan's come and talked to you. They do, uh, yes. And engineers have come, so w what are they saying? Yeah, they've been kind enough, they've been kind enough to listen to our concern and we talked to the engineer and they're going to try to develop a model based on the uh, current uh, tidal levels. And you know, try to I suppose try to factor in the impact of uh, you know different degrees of ice as it releases out to the passage that's proposed. If this passage can accommodate the tidal flow and the ice flow, it's got to be made bigger. But they've got to ensure they've got to make sure that uh, we, we can't have a blockage. We have a blockage. Everybody in around the innervation of Long Pond, and uh, I think if you talk to the people on the west side of the harbour. Their concerns are pretty well similar to ours, right? Mm. But I can speak for us ourselves personally that we're probably probably one of the first ones that's going to get nailed. Well, you like to say, you know, we welcome any development and encourage on them, you know, if it's done in a responsible way, and uh, you know, we encourage it if it makes sense for the, you know, for the harbour. But uh, living here all your years and see this come here with the potential risk it is, is very troubling. Well, all eyes are on Hurricane Teddy and the potential impacts across most of Atlantic Canada. We do have tropical storm warnings for uh, Nova Scotia and then for Newfoundland, we have a tropical storm watch as well as a couple special weather statements and a few wind warnings as well. So I'll break all of that down for you coming up.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. So we had a lot of rain today, it turned extremely fast, and didn't have time to absorb. And the rocks right here, as you can see, um, are climbing up on the manholes. And then we don't have, and we're trying to take them out of the way because then it's going to block the water from going in. So, yeah, this never happened. I never seen this thing happen before. I never seen, I don't know, I never seen this happen. I mean, when I was younger, like young, young, we had a flood, like in Sencha, but now, Bear Roberts, whew, I've never seen anything. So, see you later. Bye. That is so cute. When he was young, young. Young, young. Yeah, yeah. he's eight years old, by the way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Max Colburn, uh, for sending that in. He's in Bay Roberts. Great job, right? Yes, he did a wonderful job. I see a little bit of a reporting future Ooh. there, don't I? Yes. <laughs> and Ashley, it's so nice to see you in studio. It's been a long time since we've been together yep. in studio. That's right. Yeah, back in studio, just, uh, you know, Teddy is on the way, so yeah, we're going to talk about that. Lots of weather. Yeah, to watch. <laughs> lots of weather to watch, certainly. Uh, but I mean, it's been relatively quiet mm -hmm. uh, up until now. So let's take a look at uh, the temperatures across the board. Feeling very fall like fall is uh, officially begins tomorrow. So the weather is perfect for that, I suppose. 13 degrees for St. John's today. 16 in uh, Badger, or these are current temperatures rather, 16 in Badger, 14 in Corner Brook, and then we've got those temperatures uh, relatively mild too, up through Labrador, 14 degrees in Lab City as we speak. So we do have an area of high pressure that's dominating right now, not a whole lot going on. We are seeing some of the cloud cover from Teddy move in, just high cloud at this point, and you can see that just to the south. Now over the next 24 hours, we do have a few things in play. This ridge of high pressure is going to uh, help or move Teddy over the next 24 hours. So here's the latest right now. It is going to update within the next probably 10, 15 minutes, but this is the latest that I have at the moment. 150 kilometer per hour winds with Hurricane Teddy moving east of Bermuda. You can see it starting that northerly track, and that's what we're expecting to happen. We may see a little bit of intensification to a Cat 2 by the time the overnight rolls around, but then as it starts to interact with some of that cooler water, it's going to turn over our uh, move to what is called a post tropical storm and that just means it loses its tropical characteristics. It's no longer being fueled by the warm ocean and starts interacting more with the atmosphere. So here's what's going to happen. We've got that ridge of high pressure right now. That's going to slide further east as we head through the night tonight, leading to those frost advisories for most of the island. You'll see a little bit of a shift in Teddy. It'll head west and then this ridge of high pressure and that other ridge of high pressure is going to move out and that's going to allow Teddy to make that westward turn. At this point, models pointing a good consensus of seeing a landfall somewhere around Halifax and then head towards Newfoundland as we head into the overnight Wednesday and into Thursday. So it's going to stick around for a while. Post tropical systems also spread out quite a bit. So we're going to see uh, the effects of this pretty much through Friday. So as it stands now, here's a look at the track. Anything to the south of that is where we're going to see the heaviest uh, winds upwards of 110 kilometers per hour, some heavy rain as well. To the north of that is where we'll see some gusty winds and heaviest rain. Otherwise, it's just looking like a gusty day with the potential for uh, some showers as well. So tropical storm watch in place right now along the South Shore, uh, Southern Newfoundland, rather uh, Burgio and Port of Basque with a special weather statement. The other thing that Teddy is going to bring is those uh, waves as well. Six to as much as eight, maybe even nine meter waves with some storm surge expected. This will happen Tuesday night into Wednesday night. And then we've got a special weather statement in effect for uh, southeastern portions of Labrador, and that's because you're going to see some of that heavy rain as well. So here's a forecast for tomorrow. Winds will start to ramp up. You'll see out of the east there. That's why uh, Environment Canada has issued a uh, wreck house wind warning where we'll see gusts near about 100, 130 kilometers per hour. But a beautiful day tomorrow for Labrador. Very much, uh, even though tomorrow's the first day of fall, feeling very much like summer. 21 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay, 16 in Nain. That's double what your daily high should be around this time of year. So here's that wreck house warning as I was talking about. It's going to come in two waves. So Tuesday night and then again Wednesday night as Teddy nears a little bit closer. 
Here's an early uh, rainfall projection. It's looking like the south coast will see the most rain at this point, 50 to as much as 75 millimeters of rain. And then there's that swath as well, where we could see uh, as much as that as you head towards coastal portions of Labrador. And that will fall Tuesday through pretty much Thursday, uh, Thursday evening. Wednesday is going to be windy across the board. We're looking at uh, temperatures, that big push of warm air as well with that tropical system. Uh, 20, 18 to 21 degrees, but it will be windy. So wind gusts anywhere from 70 to as much as 90 kilometers per hour expected. And then eventually we'll see that rain make its way towards eastern portions of uh, Labrador through the day. And then the wind really will ramp up again. It's still a couple of days away, so the exact track is still up, but uh, it's looking like we'll see those windy conditions then for southeastern portions of Labrador as well as the northern peninsula and winds will eventually ease through the day on Thursday. But here's where you're going to be sitting temperature wise return uh, back down to about seasonal 15 degrees in St. John 17 in Corner Brook, and then we've got those cooler temperatures, maybe even a few flurries in play for Lab City. So over the next couple of days, once that moves out of the way, Teddy moves out of the way, we're looking at a, a fairly nice weekend at this point, uh, 14 to 16 degrees, even looking ahead. Some of that warmer air is going to make a return. Ridge of high pressure will dominate. So we're looking at uh, a fairly nice start to the weekend for central Newfoundland, 14 degrees for you by Friday, Saturday, back up to 18 degrees, similar temperatures for Western Newfoundland and Good thing those temperatures will stay in the teens as we head through the overnight as well. For Eastern Labrador, you're looking at about uh, 11 to 12 degrees as we uh, head into the weekend. And then uh, for Western Labrador, a dip, single digits. And then by Saturday, those temperatures will return to around seasonal. Wanted to share this lovely shot. Look at this sun setting on Indian Cove in Labrador. Thank you so much to Sandra Rumbolt for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Thank you very much, Ashley. We'll keep an eye on that forecast over the next couple of days. As Terry Roberts reported earlier, it was 10 years ago today that Hurricane Igor brought devastating rains to several communities on the island. It was only a tropical storm when it hit, but it was the worst to ever land in Newfoundland. Here now producer Lee Pitts was a reporter during that time, and on the fifth anniversary of Igor, he shared a story about a home and a family in Trouty that he'll never forget. Take a look. There were so many uh, people I met along the way. One I recall in Trouty where the house actually picked up off of its um, foundation and started to float down the river. Um, and they thought it was gonna float out to sea, except that it caught up in something and swung around. But as the house was floating and the family inside realized they were about to lose the house, I believe it was the, the father who, who got his wife and children out. And by the time he got them out, the house had given way and had started to float down the river. And um, the way the story is told to me is that he actually jumped out the front door into the river and, and swam to safety as the house floated along. He got his mother out and got her to dry land and his wife and he came back in for to get the few things that he had picked up and to get the dog. And by that time, that's how fast the river came up. He just knew he had no other course but to jump out. In that same community, uh, apparently an RV or a large trailer, um, camper, was picked up and just washed away and never seen again. So there were stories of that kind of, uh, those kinds of, of, I guess, damage and, and, and um, heroics, you know, survival uh, that really stand out. We're heading into the fall seasons where the leaves start to change color, but they're not supposed to look like this. Coming up, we'll speak with Todd Boland of Munn Botanical Gardens about why your maples are covered in black splotches. What's that they say about the weather being lovely for a duck? Well, these little ones in Bowering Park expanded their swimming real estate on Saturday. Too cute. We'll be back. Stay with us.
Well, tomorrow is the first day of fall. Pretty soon the leaves will start falling, but you may have noticed that some maple leaves in the city of St. John's have already started changing color, but it's not due to the change in season. Joining me now is Todd Boland with Munn Botanical Garden. So Todd, what is up with the maple leaves this year? Unfortunately, this year we happened to get a really bad infestation of a particular disease called tar spot. Um, the fortunate thing is this disease only affects Norway maples and red maples. This particular disease is called tar spot for an obvious reason. So what you see on the leaves um, are these concentric dark black spots. Usually you have a very distinctive yellow ring around the, the spots as well. Starts off as small spots as the season progresses, the spots get larger and larger. And eventually the spots get quite large. They start to coalesce, join up together. Then you start to see the leaves curling in on themselves. And at that stage is when the trees usually say, enough is enough, um, and they end up shedding the leaves early. Okay, so it won't kill your tree. It will not kill your tree. Your tree will leaf out best pine next spring again. You just won't get your good fall color that you oftentimes want to see on your trees. This is caused by a particular fungus. Um, the fungus actually overwinters in, on the leaves and the ground, and then they reinfect the trees in the spring of the year. But the disease itself doesn't really start to crop up, we'll say, until the latter part of the summer and through to the early fall season. So overall, it doesn't do any major serious damage. It's a cosmetic problem. So the trees might look really horrible at this stage. They may lose their leaves early, but overall, in the long run of things, the trees will still be perfectly fine for next year. So if you have this in your, uh, in your trees, in your garden, do you need to worry about it spreading to the other trees or any of the other plants in your garden? No, because this particular disease is very, very host specific. And so much so that it only affects Norway, the red maples, what we, what we call the Crimson King Norway maples. Um, and it affects, uh, to a lesser degree, a plant is called a box elder, which is another type of maple. Not that many of those in St. John's anyway. So it won't even affect your Japanese maples. So I mean, if you love your Japanese maples, have no worries. This disease will not bother those at all. And it won't bother anything else in your garden either. It seems pretty bad this year. I'm seeing a lot of trees with these spots on them uh, around St. John's. Is it worse this year than years past? What have you noticed? Well, the first time I started to see this disease was probably six or seven years ago. I started seeing it popping up. This year, I have to admit, I've never seen it as bad. Um, I suspect it's probably climate related, but we certainly had more than a fair share of really high humidexes, particularly in the month of August. And it seems like a lot of the fungal diseases seem to get more prevalent as the season progresses. So we sort of had a combination, a perfect storm, we'll say, with the high humidity levels in August, the warmer temperatures, um, and plus late in the season. And that just seems to be great conditions to get these particular fungal diseases to start to crop up. The key with this particular disease, however, is to keep the leaves off the ground as much as possible. It's still early in the season, and we don't want all those leaves gathering on your lawn because that could do damage to your lawn. But I got a good point, or a good point to this, is that you can compost those leaves. And I know a lot of people are concerned, oh, is this disease going to infect my vegetable crops, or, or is it going to affect other flowers in my garden? But it doesn't. So it's perfectly fine for you to go ahead, compost those leaves, use that compost, it's black gold, use it on your flower beds. Um, chances are, however, this disease is probably going to be around for a while, if not forevermore. Um, I suspect some years will be worse than others. Todd Boland, thank you so much for uh, telling us about this and for easing some of my worries. Oh, you're very <laughs> welcome, Carolyn. <laughs>
lowered them and replaced them with the Acadian flag and the flag for the region of Digby Neck. Then they came here to the Matagan DFO office where they dropped off Mi'kmaq lobster harvest traps that they hauled in over the weekend. They call the traps, quote, evidence of federal fisheries violations because of modifications and missing tags. This all comes after days of confrontation between the two sides of this dispute. Here's what Luke LeBlanc of the Maritime Fishermen's Union has to say about the tension. Well, it's regrettable. I mean, you know, the federal government should have stepped in at some point. I mean, folks are folks are breaking the law and, and the federal government needs to stand up. We're, we're, we're asking where, where the federal government is. Where's, where's the prime minister on this? The commercial fishermen say their fight is not with the Mi'kmaq, it's with the federal government for failing to clarify the rules. Still, their actions over the past week have disrupted the Mi'kmaq harvest. Sebaganegadi Chief Michael Sack said yesterday the band had run out of traps, but they were expecting hundreds more to arrive today through donations. As long as they have equipment and the weather allows, the Mi'kmaq fishers say they plan to drop more traps in the waters of St. Mary's Bay. Taryn Grant, CBC News, Matagan. Welcome back to Here and Now. 
Well, you've probably heard a lot about the rise in COVID-19 cases and renewed restrictions in several regions of Canada. Well, in Europe, the September surge is a whole lot worse. Instead of daily new cases in the hundreds, like in Ontario and Quebec, many EU nations are facing new infections in the thousands every day, including in the UK, where the Prime Minister is expected to announce a new lockdown tomorrow. Renee Filipponi reports. It's a sunny last day of summer and Londoners are taking advantage, shopping and eating out, knowing things could soon change. Personally, I'm totally expecting there to be another lockdown um, to keep us safe, so I'm all on board, to be honest. Already, there are an increasing number of localized lockdowns in parts of the country with surges. Today, a stark warning from government scientists. If nothing is done to curb the increase, the UK could see 50,000 new cases a day by mid-October. We have, in a bad sense, literally turned a corner, although only relatively recently. And we, I think everybody will realize that at this point, the seasons are against us. The spike is already more serious in other parts of Europe, especially Spain. Neighborhoods in Madrid are now under strict lockdown, with people only able to leave for work, school and medical care. It's crazy, says this woman. They shouldn't be confining us to neighborhoods. Protesters greeted Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez as he met with regional leaders today. This is not a game, he said, promising Madrid the support it needs to help bend the curve. France is also preparing for things to get worse. In Paris, 20 new testing centers opened to help with the backlog of people needing COVID screening. In some parts of the country, hospitals are already near capacity as the number of people with serious cases of the disease grows. We must act in solidarity with the hospitals, says the mayor of Paris, who believes the next two weeks will see a significant strain on the system. And that's what they're hoping to avoid in the UK, where the coronavirus alert level was raised today and more broad restrictions to curb the virus are expected tomorrow. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, physical adjustments to deal with the pandemic have created challenges for blind and partially sighted people. In the new normal, where touch is discouraged and social distancing relies on signage, many feel their needs have not been taken into account. CBC's Vernon Ramazar has the story. Are you ready? And forward. Let's go straight. Good boy, Dimitri. Darlene Wernell lives in Lake Echo. She's totally blind and treasures her independence. Before the pandemic, if she needed anything, she and Dimitri, her guide dog, would head up the road and take the bus to wherever they needed to go. It's not so simple nowadays. I'm a really hands-on type of person. I have to touch things to know what they look like in order for me to know exactly where I'm going to sit because I certainly don't want to sit on somebody or... You know, if there's a stroller there, I don't want to trip over it. Most distancing markers in buildings are visual, and that's not much help to blind and partially sighted people like Shelley Adams of the CNIB Foundation. I think it would be great to have some tactile markings on the ground um, and contrast too, because for those who are partially sighted, having good contrasting colors for the arrows is important. The challenges posed by shopping and the possibility of exposure have led many blind people like Barry Abbott to order their groceries online. When you're blind, touch is your primary sense besides hearing. So you're, you're, you're you know, um, something as simple, say, say you're paying for something and you, you wanna, you gotta feel where the reader is so you can hold your card over it or your iPhone. He thinks the pandemic has been a learning period for everyone, but hopes it will lead to meaningful change. Something that people haven't thought about, and, and uh, those of us with disabilities have a responsibility to make very clear what we need. Darlene Wernell offers some simple advice for the public. Try not to distract the dog or touch the dog, because um, it can be quite dangerous, but most of all is just... Um, help if you see someone who needs assistance for sure offer that because we're not going to know that anybody's out there. Vernon Ramisar, CBC News, Halifax.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Canada's Olympic athletes weighed in today on whether the International Olympic Committee should loosen its rules against protests at the Games. There are worldwide consultations happening. American athletes have already said they want the right to take a stand on social issues at the Olympics. Canadians, however, are suggesting a more moderate approach. The CBC Scott Russell has the details. The Canadian Olympic Committee's Athletes Commission has come up with seven recommendations vis-a-vis -vis Olympic Charter Rule 50, which prevents demonstrations and propaganda on the Olympic field of play or the Olympic podium. The general theme of those recommendations is a call for clarity. The Canadian athletes want to know exactly what is an acceptable demonstration, exactly what is respectful of all athletes, and they want to know what are the consequences should Rule 50 be contravened. They're also asking for some safe space within the Olympic Village for athletes to express their points of view. Nowhere do the Canadian athletes call for the outright abolition of Rule 50. As a matter of fact, they say the only area of consensus is that the field of play at the Olympic Games, the Olympic podium, must be maintained as neutral space above all else. Those recommendations now go to the IOC Athletes Commission, who will in turn report their findings and make recommendations to the IOC Executive Board early in 2021. For CBC News, I'm Scott Russell. Well, and staying with sports, this month marks the 40th anniversary of the Marathon of Hope, a marathon which started right here in St. John's. When Terry Fox had to give up his cross-country run, he asked Canadians to keep his dream alive. And they did. Across the country yesterday, people took part in a virtual marathon in support of cancer research. To mark the occasion, we've dipped into the CBC archives to bring you this report from 1980. This afternoon in St. John's, Newfoundland, a young man named Terry Fox started running, and he says he won't stop till he reaches British Columbia. John McQuaker has the story. This afternoon at 2.45 in St. John's Harbor, Terry Fox dipped his foot into the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The beginning of a cross-country run. Many people have run or walked across Canada, but Fox hopes to be the first to do it with an artificial leg. He lost his right leg to cancer three years ago and decided he wasn't going to allow the loss to affect his outlook on life. To demonstrate that cancer can be beaten and to give hope to others as well as raise money for the Cancer Society, he's convinced he can make it on one good and one artificial leg from here to Vancouver Island. Whatever you do, you got to do the, the best you can possibly do and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it everything I, I possibly can. It's just going to be, if, if I don't make it, it's going to be something that uh, nobody would make it. After making his way from the harbor to City Hall, Fox, wearing the mayor's cloak of office, raised the flag of the Kansas Society. And after being given greetings from the mayor for the people of British Columbia, he finally got on his way out of the city. Fox has got a supply of eight pairs of running shoes and three extra legs as well as spare parts in a van. A friend from Port Coquitlam, his hometown, is driving all the way with him. At 30 miles a day, roughly, they hope to hit the West Coast by next fall in five or six months. John McQuaker, CBC News, St. John's. Well, time for a last look at the weather. So, Ashley, what's on tap for tomorrow? So it's going to be a chilly start to the day. We're probably going to wake up to some frost uh, for parts of the province, certainly uh, for the island. We're looking at temperatures uh, around the two, three, four, five degree mark in the morning. Uh, cloudy to start though for the south, and that's because we're going to start to see some of that cloud cover move in from Hurricane Teddy or what will be post tropical storm uh, heady. Teddy at that point. So temperatures tomorrow will be sitting in uh, the 15 to 13, 13 to 15 degree range along the south coast and you'll see those winds ramp up out of the east and that's why we do have a uh, wreck house wind warning in effect. And then as we head through the day, you'll start to see that rain move further north and temperatures should be sitting around 17 to 19 degrees for the majority of the province. And again, those winds will ramp up as we head towards the evening hours, the further north you get. And then up through Labrador, a beautiful start to fall. We're looking at about 21 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay and 16 in Nain. Great, thanks so much, Ashley.
but it's beautiful in Labrador. Well, the team of Schitt's Creek is celebrating its sweep at the Emmys last night. The CBC production was recognized for outstanding comedy series, writing, directing, and all four of the show's stars won awards for acting. Eugene Levy thanked his son, Dan. I also want to thank once again this young man who took our fish out of water story about the Rose family and transformed it into a celebration of inclusivity, a castigation of homophobia, and a declaration of the power of love. Are you are you vibrating right now? Like, what is it? <laughs> what is it? What I do don't think know? it's really sunk in. I think, in a way, it's like because we were just having our own little party here, it just <laughs> kind of feels like, you know, something that happened. It almost feels like a dress rehearsal or something. Now, the winners accepted their awards at a party in Toronto's Casa Loma. Schitt's Creek becomes the first program ever to sweep all comedy categories. Wow. There you go. Congratulations. That's great to see a Canadian show win that big at the end. I feel like with the year that we've had with 2020, there was a bit of a recognition that a yeah. show that's, you know, kind of filled with goodness and happiness is maybe something that we need to celebrate this year. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Hope you can join us again tomorrow evening. Yep, we'll be keeping an eye. Ashley is going to have uh, more of those hurricane updates, so stay with us. Good have a night. good night.